in effect, people be able to eat whatever they want and still not uh, gain weight. So that would be very, very nice. I know that you had said in the book there's a thousand drugs in the pipeline already for RNA interference methods. I noticed and I felt in reading Transcend, you didn't have much reluctance or concern about the drugs. I know in a little part of it, you talked about, yes, there are some bad drugs that are out there, but do you have confidence in the pharmaceutical industry with respect to coming up with drugs that don't have terrible side effects? Well, that's the problem with, with drugs is most drugs do have side effects. So my personal bias is to use drugs as little as possible. So for instance, uh, one of the most commonly prescribed drugs today uh, are the uh, statin drugs, which are used to lower cholesterol. And if people need to lower their cholesterol, what we do in our clinic is we suggest that they make appropriate dietary changes and also look at some nutrients things like red yeast rice and niacin and plant sterols. And through the use of those, uh, the majority of patients can lower even extremely high cholesterol levels to more desirable levels and avoid the use of these drugs. And the reason I would prefer to avoid these drugs is many of these, many people that take these drugs develop muscle pains, uh, liver function abnormalities, uh, It it reduces the production of coenzyme Q10, which is a critical nutrient in the body that helps prevent cancer and high blood pressure. So even though there are occasional patients that need to take uh, powerful statin drugs, the majority actually don't need to. Uh, There are, on the other hand, a few prescription drugs that I think are very beneficial. One of them is uh, an an FDA-approved drug for diabetes known as metformin. And metformin works to help blood sugar move, move help sugar move from the blood to inside of the cells. And we, we know now that the only proven method of increasing the life expectancy of laboratory animals is caloric restriction, uh, cutting their calories by as much as a third. Very few people want to do that. Most people don't want to cut their calories by a third Doing so, uh, you're, you're hungry much of the time. You have a very gaunt appearance. So what we'd like to do is we would like to be able to experience the benefits of caloric restriction without restricting our calories. And it appears that metformin is a medication that mimics the effects of caloric restriction in our bodies. So even for non-diabetics, uh, it, is, it, it is safe for the majority of people to consider taking uh, Metformin. So we will use uh, some of these medications in an off-label use for life extension purposes. Um, So uh, I'm not totally opposed to the use of medications, but we want to do so uh, in a safe fashion. I also found you're making the distinction between the glycemic load versus the glycemic index. And I really felt that that was cutting to the chase when it comes to evaluating our food. Could you explain that? Yeah. When, when we eat, uh, uh, carbohydrates in particular, we, we diff, we differentiate between what are referred to as high glycemic index carbohydrates and low glycemic index. And glycemic index refers to the rate at which that food breaks down into simple sugar. So if we have, uh, a food such as popcorn, or uh, white bread, or white potatoes. These are foods that have a relatively high glycemic index because they break down into sugar very quickly. If we have a food such as brown rice, or sweet potatoes, or beans, or lentils, these are examples of carbohydrate foods that have very low glycemic index. So if we were just going to compare glycemic index to glycemic index, high versus low, we would prefer the, the low glycemic index foods because they release their sugar more slowly, which means that the body can burn it. When we eat high glycemic index foods, the, the bloodstream gets a sudden surge of sugar. We can't burn it quick enough, so it gets turned into fat, stored as fat. Uh, but that's not the whole answer. If we just look at glycemic index, we would, we would compare carrots or peas. Carrots and peas have very high glycemic index. However, they don't have a lot of carbohydrates in them, so what we do is we actually measure the total grams of carbohydrates in a food times their glycemic index 
to get what's called the glycemic load, and then the glycemic load will tell us what the effect of that food is on our body. It's a much more sensitive indicator of whether or not to avoid that food. So things like carrots are actually safe to eat because they have a low glycemic load. But then on the other hand, if we have carrot juice, a glass of carrot juice actually has a lot of uh, grams of carbohydrates in it and therefore has a high glycemic load. So it, 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 it's another level of information for us. What has been your personal challenge that you found in getting people up to speed with what frames of reference they really need to be paying attention to, to live long enough to have a chance at living forever? Well, I think that many of us don't, you know, believe in the possibilities. Uh, and therefore, since we don't believe in the possibilities, we're not willing to take the steps that are necessary to bring them to fruition. I think you have to have a vision that it is possible to live to be 120 years of age and to do so in optimal health. And I think with uh, present-day technologies, it's certainly possible to live to be 90 or 95 and stay in very good health. I have a number of patients in their 90s, and their brains are sharp, and they're physically active. Uh, And I think that with the technologies that are available and the new uh, diagnostic abilities we have, that we'll be able to extend this to 100 and then to 120 uh, within the next uh, couple decades. Uh, So you first have to have the belief that this is possible. Uh, Then if you believe that it's possible, you have to be willing to take the steps uh, so that you can optimize your health to to do the tests that are necessary to, 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 to to detect disease as early as possible. So it can be, can be treated before it goes on uh, to become difficult. We can use that same rule of 80-20 to apply to d- disease to detection as we did to uh, talking about genes and economics. Like with heart disease, we were talking about the fact that most people don't find out they have a, a heart disease until they have a heart attack. That's because the rule of 80-20 is, is, is at play there. We can be building up cholesterol within the walls of our arteries. We can include... 50%, 60%, 70% of our arteries, and yet we don't develop any symptoms. It's when we get up around 80% and there's only 20% of the blood through that artery that's available uh, to the heart muscle that we then be- begin to develop these symptoms. Yet by then, it's already uh, too late. Um, patients need to look at surgical options. Patients are at high risk of heart attacks. The same thing applies with, uh, with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, uh, which affects almost 20 million Americans now. Uh, the People uh, become overweight, they eat the wrong high glycemic uh, foods, uh, they, they overstress their pancreas. The cells in the pancreas that make the insulin, uh, the islet cells, uh, wear out. You lose 10%, 50%, 60%, 70% of those cells, and your blood sugar doesn't go up. When you lose 80% of your cells, at that point, your blood sugar starts to rise and then you can be diagnosed with diabetes, but you've already knocked out 80% of your pancreas, and that can't be restored. So we would like to, to do a much better job of early detection, uh, which will help us as well. This is so manageable. That's one of the most exciting things about the book, is that everything that was offered was very manageable, very practical, very much within reach. I do think you're right, that a lot of people don't believe they can live long and live well. People can do them on their own. They're available on their, online. They're available through their conventional physicians. And some of the tests, you know, need to be done in an anti-aging clinic like our clinic in Denver. Uh, and they may want to do some through us and some through their family doctors. But these things are widely accessible. So I think people really do want it to, to, take, to take their own health into their own hands. Uh, and when we talk about Transcend, the first step of Transcend, the T, the T stands for talk with your doctor. I mean, when you go in and talk to a lawyer, when you go in and talk to an accountant, if you go in with a plan for what you want to accomplish, uh, you, will, you will get more done in the course of that visit. And I think the same thing can happen when you go in and see a, a physician. If you go in with a plan, if you know what you want to accomplish, rather than having the doctor be in charge, you can get a lot more, more done in the course of your visits. I wanted to talk about how in the beginning of the book, I think it was Ray talked about how we create our brains. I thought that was fascinating about how our thoughts and how we feel impacts our brain and brain chemistry. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, Ray right now is, is, is writing a book about the brain and how to re-engineer the brain. And uh, it's really fascinating that we've discovered that we, we, we actually control your thoughts to a far greater degree than we thought also. Um, there is a saying, 
nerve 